moves in a mysterious way His wonders to perform He plants his footsteps in the sea And rides upon the storm Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill He treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will Take courage now you fearful saints The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy Shall break your blessings on your head, and I will trust the hands that made the starry heavens, and I will trust the wounds of Calvary. I will trust, and I will not be afraid, for all His ways are. And I can't wait for church to start up again, to open the doors, and for us to have a real church service again. I would like to share a few words with you. On Monday evening, as I made my way to bed, I asked the Lord Jesus what what He was like after His resurrection. What what type and kind of body He had now? Was He still fully God, or was He now fully God, or was He still? God in man, God in the flesh. I'm asking God to reveal this answer to me. So I went to sleep and early in the morning I woke up and I think I, I, I had the answer. Jesus died and he laid down his earthly body in the grave. He was buried and after three days God his father resurrected him from the grave. And now with the glorified body Jesus was and he is fully God. He has a new body. Something completely perfect and suitable for heaven. Jesus now can walk through doors and walls. He could appear and disappear. He could make himself visible and invisible. Now here's the wonderful good news for us as children of God. That we will also be receiving exactly the same body as Jesus Christ. We will be changed from the corruptible into the incorruptible after his appearing. 1 John 3 verse 2 and 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51 and 50, uh, to 53. We will be having perfect bodies. Now this is very good news. No struggling with old age and pains and aches and illnesses and death. Um, and, and you know that the daily struggles that we go through. Now here's something to think about. While we, as children of God, enjoy perfect glorified bodies in heaven for all eternity, Jesus Christ our Lord will still be bearing the scars of his crucifixion, the marks of the nails in his hands and on his feet and in his side, for us to remind us what he did on the cross of Calvary, and the price that he paid uh, for us to bring us to Christ and to spend eternity in heaven with him. Don't we have enough reason to thank God for all who we are and what we are daily, 24 hours a day, thank, thanking God for salvation, for the gift of eternal life. Just want to thank the Lord Jesus Christ for what he has done. Thank you for allowing me to share these few words. Um, Bless you all, keep well, and uh, hopefully just a few more days of lockdown, and then we'll be together again. God bless, and see you again. Thank you, and goodbye. Good morning, everybody. Um, we want to welcome you to the um, YouTube um, service of Croydon Baptist Church. Um, we are, over the next few weeks, going to be looking at a psalm, a very common psalm, um, 
alongside Psalms 23. It's most often read at funerals. And um, my hope is over the next few weeks as we look at the psalm um, that God will give us um, wisdom and assurance of knowing how best to respond to these um, trying times we're living in. Um, the psalm we're going to look at is Psalms 91. And this psalm describes God's ongoing protection over his people um, who are going through a difficult time. Whenever you are uh, wanting to study a passage in the Bible, one of the first things you do is you look at who wrote it. And um, the next thing you do is, well, why did they write it? Um, the question as to who wrote Psalms 91 is, well, we don't know. And uh, the question as to why did he write it, in other, by that I mean what were the specific circumstances that was going on in his life as to the reason he wrote it, well we don't know that um, either. Um, but listen to how the psalm is described um, by, just let me mention two people, G. Campbell Morgan described the psalm as, the, as one of the greatest possessions of the saints. Spurgeon described the psalm in this way It's one of the most excellent works of this kind ever Which ever appeared It is impossible to imagine anything more solid more beautiful more profound or more on or more ornamented Let's read Psalms 91 together he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the error that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that walked wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thus that way, and ten thousand shall at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet, because he hath set his love upon me, therefore I will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show my, him my salvation. Well, we don't know exactly what was going on when the writer of the psalm wrote the psalm, we know exactly how he was feeling. As you were reading the psalm, can you think of one word that really stood out that is that could be used as an umbrella word to describe what he's feeling? I've come up with the word trouble. It's found in verses 15 of Psalms chapter 91. He writes, He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I God says, will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. I've chosen the word in trouble as an umbrella word that I am using to capture all the circumstances described in the psalm. What does the word in trouble mean? The word describes somebody who is in a place of restriction. The Bible is filled with examples of people who have been in trouble. People who have been in a place of restriction. Here are some examples. Psalms 46 verses 1. The psalmist describes himself as being 
in trouble. And then using poetry, he says, Though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried in the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, he's in a place of restriction. One of my favorite passages is Genesis chapter 32. It's the man Jacob. Jacob um, is a man who typifies the title of Frank Sinatra's song, I Did It My Way. Well, around 20 years before Genesis chapter 32, he um, has to flee his family home. Uh, he conned him and his mom, conned his brother Jacob, uh, sorry, Esau. He hasn't heard from Esau for a long time. And the last time he heard from his brother, his brother said to him, I'm going to kill you. Well, now we fast forward 20 years. He leaves Laban. He's got a family and of his own. And so he wants to hear suss his brother Esau out and so he sends messengers um, to Esau to find out how things are going and the messengers after a while the messengers come back and um, they say your brother Esau is coming to meet you with 400 men well Jacob panics actually the Bible says he's greatly afraid and distressed I would be too and so he begins to pray and uh, asks God to deliver him. He gets up in the morning. He sends, he, try, he sends a whole lot of gifts with his messengers and tells them to give the, the gifts to Esau. They come back. Esau's still on his way with 400 men. Well, this happens three times. Each time, Jacob tries and um, pacifies Esau with gifts and it doesn't help and so that night after the third time he wakes up he takes his family his wives he has them cross over a river Jabbok and then the Bible says and he's all alone he's in a place of restriction Israel when they um, left Egypt in the book of Exodus found themselves in a place of restriction they had behind them Pharaoh's army chasing them. In front of them, they had the vast Red Sea. They had nowhere to go. They are in trouble. They are in a place of restriction. Maybe that describes you this morning. Maybe you have, maybe you're lonely and your family can't visit you. You find yourself in trouble. In a place of restriction maybe you in a in trouble financially your businesses has had to close there's absolutely no human way of making an income and you find yourself in trouble in a place of restriction maybe your credit cards are maxed out and your boss has put you on um, short time and so you're not getting enough salary to pay a bond you find yourself in a place of restriction if that is how you are feeling this morning, that's exactly how the psalmist felt in Psalms chapter 91. He's in trouble. He's in a place of restriction. He describes this place of restriction using words found in verses 3, verse 5, verse 6, and verses 10. Listen to how he describes his place of restriction, his trouble. Verse 3. He describes his place of restriction as a snare. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare. He feels trapped. He uses the word noisome pestilence in verse 3. A plague. It reminds me of a friend of ours who, um, a longtime family friend who's just received news that she has cancer and it's terminal. And she finds her place herself in a place of restriction. Verse 5. The place of the, the restriction is described as a terror. Verse 6. Pestilence again. Verse 6 again. Destruction. Verses 10. Evil. In other words, he's going through misery. Depression. He's sad. Verses 10. He uses the word plague. Open sores. 
these are graphic terms used to describe whatever this person is going through and so what i want to do this morning as we begin psalms chapter 91 we are going to um, not go through it expository by that i mean we're not going to through it we're not going to go through it verse by verse and expound the passage we are going to use chap uh, psalms chapter 91 as a foundation um, and pretty much what we're going to do is we are going to um, this morning answer two questions whenever you looking at um, a passage that deals with trouble um, difficulties or a terror or evil generally what happens is the question is asked where does all this come from and so that's what we're going to look at this morning we're going to look at two questions where do troubles and terrors come from and then secondly we are going to ask the answer the question what are we as believers to do so those are the two questions where do troubles come from and then what do we as believers do and we're going to look at psalms chapter 91 as a foundation for this let's pray lord we thank you for your word thank you for the fact that your word is an authority in our lives and teach us something this morning in your precious son's name i pray amen so if you are going to do evangelism or you're busy with youth or whatever you are somewhere along the line someone's going to ask you this question where do terrors and troubles come from well it's not specifically addressed in psalms chapter 91 as we begin psalms chapter 91 it's a good opportunity to answer the question as we lay a foundation for this wonderful psalms where do troubles and terrors um, come from if you've asked this question you're not alone Amos chapter 3 verse 6 if you want to turn there in this verse God asks the same question now we know that God doesn't ask this question because he doesn't know the answer he asks this question because he wants to get us to think let me read the question that God asks he says in verse 6 the last part of Amos chapter 3 verse 6 shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it tell me if someone had to ask you the question where do troubles and terrors come from how would you answer them thankfully Isaiah 45 verses 5 to 7 God answers the question God in this passage is talking to Cyrus and he says to Cyrus in verses 5 I am the Lord and there is none else there is no God beside me Cyrus I girded thee though thou hast not known me the me verse 6 that they may know from the rising of the Sun and from the West that there is none besides me I am the Lord and there is none else what God is highlighting to Cyrus is that Cyrus I am God God is claiming exclusivity over here he carries on speaking to Cyrus in verse 7 Cyrus I form the light and create darkness Cyrus I make peace and create evil I the Lord do all these things Ashley if you look at Ashley's WhatsApp picture he's got a picture of himself sitting on a chair and um, next to him is a picture of what of Jesus and the picture is one of where Ashley is uh, asking Jesus questions and that's the picture I get over here uh, God is speaking to Cyrus and he's telling Cyrus all these things Cyrus there's no other God but me and then he says to Cyrus Cyrus I formed the light Cyrus don't you believe that I created the Sun well Cyrus would have said yes Cyrus don't you believe that I create darkness in other words Cyrus don't you believe that I create the moon and the stars yes Cyrus you enjoying peace this morning a good cup of coffee breakfast did I create that God says yes I make peace well Cyrus what about when things are going when you're going through disaster when you're going through tragedy 
when you're going through some form of calamity, do you believe that I created that? That's what God is saying to Cyrus. I form the light and create darkness in verse 7. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. On the one hand, we can enjoy peace. We must remember when we're enjoying peace, it comes from God. But on the other hand, when we are going through some form of disaster, tragedy and calamity, Isaiah 45, God tells us it's from Him as well. I am the one, God says, who does all these things. Now, when you're going through some form of tragedy and difficulty, whatever whatever's going on, it is not when God says in verses 7, I make peace and I create evil. It's not merely that God knows about them. God knows what you're going through. That is very, very true and it's comforting. But the Bible goes beyond that. It's not just true that God, whatever you're going through, God cares about you and your circumstance. And that is true. But the Bible goes beyond that. The Bible goes beyond Romans chapter 8 verse 28. All this is true, but the foundational layer to all of this, the reason why we know God knows what we're going through, the reason why we know that God cares when we as believers are going through some form of difficulty, is because of the fact that God is the cause and source of of all what we are going through all of the above is founded ultimately on the fact that god has caused and is the source of it all now i'm not trying to tell you i understand it all all i'm trying to do as we begin psalms chapter 91 is giving us this this foundational layer of the fact whatever trouble we find ourselves in that god is providentially in control of it all all of what is happening to you and to me is under the sovereign or under the Lord's sovereign um, superintendence the theological term for all of this is called the is called God's providence God's providence means it's his most holy wise and powerful preserving and governing of all his creatures and all their actions to his own glory let me read that again God's providence is His most holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing of all His creatures and all their actions to His own glory. A few hundred years ago, someone described God's providence in this way. He said, there's no such thing as blind fate. But there is a providence, a God that guides and governs the world. Proverbs 16 verse 33 tells us the lot is cast into the lap but the but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord he writes providence is God's ordering all issues and events of things after the counsel of his will for to his own glory the wheels of the clock seem to move contrary one to the other but they help forward the motion of the clock and make the alarm strike so the providences of God seem to be cross wheels, but for all that, they shall carry on the good of those of us who are saved. Last week, um, Victoria um, WhatsApped my wife and said to her how she enjoyed the scenery of the service because she was able to identify the, the birds um, that sang. Well, let me use that as an illustration. Let's pretend I take Victoria onto the roof and um, Victoria climbs up and she sits on the roof. Now she's able to see a lot more birds and hear a lot more birds. Tell me, Victoria, sitting on my roof, how many birds would you be able to identify? Well, I don't know, um, but I do know that she'd see a lot more than what she saw on ground. Well, let's say I take Victoria up into a helicopter and they fly up and high above the sky she now not only can see my garden not only my neighbor's garden but she can see all of Croydon tell me Victoria how many birds then can you identify 
Well, I don't know about you, but I know me. I'd l be lucky if I can identify two. Pigeons and hardy dogs. Psalms chapter 50 verses 11. God says this. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field. I know them, he says, because they are mine. Are not two sparrows sold for the farthing, a farthing? And one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Therefore, he says, fear you not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. You see why I'm mentioning all of this is the providence of God to those of us who are believers is a wonderful comforting doctrine that we can cling to when we are facing unshakable things. Everything that is happening to me, everything, whether it's good or whether it is evil, is under the Lord's sovereign superintendence. And that God is a God who loves and cares for me. The wise old Chinese gentleman lived on the troubled Mongolian border. One day his favorite horse, a beautiful white mare, jumped the fence and was seized on the other side by the enemy. His friends came to comfort him. We're so sorry about your horse, they said. That's bad news. How do you know it's bad news? He asked. It might be good news. A week later, the Chinaman looked out his window to see his mare returning at break, breakneck speed and alongside her was a beautiful stallion. He put both horses into the enclosure and his friends came to admire the new addition. What a beautiful horse, they said. That's good news. How do you know it's good news? replied the man. It might be bad news. The next day, the man's only son decided to try riding the stallion. It threw him and he landed painfully, breaking his leg. Well, his friends made another visit, all of them sympathetic, saying, We're so sorry about this. It's such bad news. How do you know it's bad news? replied the man. It might be good news. Within a month, a terrible war broke out between China and Mongolia. The Chinese recruiters came to the area, pressing all the young men into the army. All of them perished, except for the Chinaman's son, who couldn't go off to war because of his broken leg. You see, said the gentleman, the things you considered good were actually bad, and the things that seemed to be bad news were actually good for, our, for his good, he said. Somebody said this, when the light of divine providence has once shone upon a godly man, he is then relieved and set free not only from the extreme anxiety and fear that were pressing him before, but from every care. Ignorance of God's providence is the ultimate misery. The highest blessedness lies in knowing that God's providence gives incredible freedom from worry about the future. I'm reminded about a story about a missionary called William Carey, who for years worked to try and fulfill his dream of going to India. Finally, he had what he, he found himself aboard a ship called the Oxford in England, bound for India. But that night a storm came and because of the winds, the ship was not able to leave the shorelines of England. Um, that later on that day, um, the ship's captain received a letter and that by an anonymous man who um, spoke some wrong things about William Carey and the end result is this would-be missionary after years of work and hope he stood on the shores with his luggage piled up beside him and his hopes dashed well he wrote a letter to his friend Andrew Fuller and listen to what he says he writes all I can say in this affair is this however the mysterious however mysterious the leadings of providence are I have no doubt, but they are superintended by an infinitely wise God. Here is a man 
who went, who's, who's going through difficulties, but his hope, the thing that he's holding on to is the fact that God is superintending it all, both good and bad. When troubles and terrors happen, and they will, we do not want to fill our minds with things that are unanswerable. Why is this going on? What if such and such happened? Because what happens when we fill our minds with questions that can't be answered, they lead to more questions. What we need to be doing is filling our minds with things that are shake, unshakable, with certainties, not with uncertainties. I need to be filling my mind with things like Ephesians chapter 1 verses 11. God worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Today as you walk through life, whatever you're going through, don't fill your mind with thing, with questions that can't be answered. Fill your mind with certainties. Things like the providence of God. Well, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 45 that peace and all evil ultimately come from God. What are we as believers to do with this information? Ecclesiastes 7 verse 13, Solomon gives us the answer. He's an elderly man writing to a younger man and he says consider the work of God for who can make that straight which he hath made crooked in the day of prosperity be joyful but in the day of adversity consider God also hath set the one over against the other to the end that man should find nothing after him in these two verses God is uh, God is teaching through Solomon his providence but he goes further in that he then tells this man because God is provident over all things what are we to do there are so many illustrations in the Bible how God's providence has worked for good I think one of the clearest ones is the story of Joseph let me read how one person described the story of Joseph. And he says, The story begins when, when Joseph brings a bad report to his father about his brothers. But the news for Joseph himself is good. He is a favorite of his father, receives a lovely coat and has dreams of grandeur, but this is not so good because his brothers resent him, attack him and throw him into a pit. But this is good because they do not kill him. Yet it is bad because they sell him into slavery. But this is good because he is purchased by a benevolent man who soon puts him in charge of his household. Yet this turns out not to be good because the man's wife lusts after him, propositions him and falsely accuses him of wrongdoing so that he's thrown into prison. Yet this is not so bad because he is soon put in a position of leadership, is able to interpret the dream of a court official and anticipates imminent release. Yet this turns out to be bad because the official forgets Joseph. But it turns out to be good because the official remembers him at a crucial juncture. And so Joseph is brought out of prison, interprets the king's dreams, and is placed second in command of the country. But bad is about to happen in the form of a famine. Yet it is good that Joseph has interpreted a prophetic dream that enables him to warn the king who can prepare for the famine. These circumstances bring Joseph's brothers to Egypt in search of food, a potentially bad situation at least for the brothers. But Joseph arranges for good to happen when they receive not only grain but also their money returned. But it becomes bad when their youngest brother is accused of, accused of theft and threatened with prison, but it turns to the good when his older, older brother offers to stay in his place. Joseph reveals himself to the brothers and the family with bad relationships now restored, is reunited and prospers in the land. However, there is one last possible scenario for bad when the brothers fear following their father's death that Joseph might harm them. But Joseph announces, don't be afraid. I am Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good 
to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. A great illustration of how God takes good, overlaps it with bad, and providentially puts all things together that He gets the honor and glory. Again, the providence of God is His most holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing of all His creatures and all their actions to His own glory. Well, if you've read Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Solomon mentions two words that tell us what we are to do in light of the fact that we serve a God who is providentially over all. Verse 13, the very first word, consider the work of God. In verses 14, towards the middle of the word, a verse, consider. What does it mean? The word consider means to inspect something intently, to investigate it, to focus on something specific. A while ago, actually a few years ago, Megan must have been maybe six or seven years old, Caleb was a baby, we went to the East Strand Mall and I got something in my eye. So I scratched my eye and my contact lens fell out and so there in the middle of the East Strand Mall, in one of the in, in, just outside one of the shops, myself, Laurie and Megan were all on our hands and knees searching intently, investigating the floor to find this one contact lens. It actually created quite a scene because we had a whole bunch of people then looking for that one contact lens. Solomon wants this, this young man who he's writing to, in light of the fact that it is only God it's God that makes things crooked and it is God that can straighten it up. God, uh, Solomon wants us to focus on something intently. What he wants us to focus on is God has made the one as well as the other. And that when God makes things crooked, only God can straighten it. I, I have a book and um, the author of this book used these two verses to get the title of his book and the title um, of his book is uh, the crook in the lot he gets it from these passages and he wrote this he said whoever would walk with God and that is key when things happen in my life that I do not understand he's the one I want to turn to he's the one who's in control of it all it's crucial for me to walk with God. He writes, whoever would walk with God must be due observers of the word of God and the providence of God. For by these in a special manner, he manifests himself to his people. In the one, which is the word of God, we see what God says. In the other, we see what God does. These are the two books that every student of God needs to be conversant with. They are both written with the one hand. The last thing I want to do when I'm going through a difficult time is go into survival mode. So many times when things happen in my life, that's a bend of the road. Things that I'm not in control over. My first instinctive reaction is to protect me protect my loved ones and I'm not saying that's wrong but that's not the very first thing we need to be thinking about sometimes when we go through difficult times like this and um, we're stuck in our home the very another thing we can think of is goody let's have fun wake up in the morning and the first thing that comes to mind is let's binge watch on YouTube let's binge watch on TV well, this is not what Solomon wants us to think, uh, do when he says the word consider. He wants us to consider the fact that God has providentially given us this time. And God has providentially, even though he's given us this more time, he still expects us to love the Lord God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind 
And so as I'm going through this time, I'm to think, how can I still love God? The, this, still, this verse still applies. How can I still love my neighbor during this time? As believers, the benefit of knowing God's providence is that it makes us patient in adversity and thankful in prosperity so that we may place our firm trust in our Heavenly Father concerning everything that befalls us. And so as we begin Psalms chapter 91, the question that is asked is where does terrors and troubles come from? Well, simply put, it comes from God. And we're going to deal with this more as we dig into Psalms chapter 91, but as an introduction, that's what the Bible says. And in light of the fact that all trouble, and in light of the fact that peace and trouble come from God as believers, what are we to do? We to do what Solomon says, and that is consider. One of um, my favorite hymns that I've recently come across, actually it was emailed to me by uh, a mom who was going through difficulties as a result of her son's ill health. The words of the song, God moves in a mysterious way. I played it in the very beginning. It was written by a man called William Cooper. William Cooper and John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace, um, were friends. Uh, William Cooper struggled with depression so much so, he was a Christian, so much so that one day he woke up and he wanted to commit suicide. He called for a carriage. He ordered the driver to take him to the Us River three miles away where he planned to kill himself. The driver, knowing the state of William Cooper's mind, breathed a prayer of thanks when a thick fog enveloped the area. And so he purposefully lost his way in the fog. Jogging up one road and down another, as eventually William Cooper fell fast asleep. Several hours passed the driver going in circles, letting his passenger rest. Finally, he returned home. We back home, said Cooper. How's that? Got lost in the fog, sir. Cooper paid his fare, went inside and pondered how he had been spared from harming himself by the merciful providence of God. That very evening, in the year 1774, he was 43 years old, reflecting on go on his narrow escape he wrote the words to the song i'm going to read it and then we'll pray god moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform he plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will you fearful saints fresh courage take the clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. Let's pray. What a wonderful thing to know, Lord, that providentially you are in control of all things. Help us to consider this when we find ourselves in a time of trouble when we find ourselves trapped, when we find ourselves in destruction, surrounded by difficulties, as a believer, help us to consider this. Help us not to make decisions based on what ifs, or if only, or fear, but help us to first of all make decisions based on the certainty that you are providentially in control of everything. In your precious son's name I pray. Amen. Thank you very much.